Hello. Today's episode number 49 of the Professor Slots podcast discusses top nine slot tips by Run Horse, a YouTube video review. Plus, in this episode, I'll be covering the current state of slot machine casino gambling in the great U.S. states of Michigan and Minnesota. Thank you for joining me for the Professor Slots podcast show. I'm John Friedel, and this is a podcast about slot machine casino gambling. It is where I provide knowledge, insights, and tools for helping you improve your slot machine gambling performance. John Friedel from the Professor Slots blog reveals all his tips and tricks for thriving in the casino environment. Choose winning slot machines and identify your gambling goals. Being entertained, earning comps, winning take-home cash, or combining them. In case you missed it, on my last episode, I went over Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, and Massachusetts slots 2018. I hope you enjoyed listening to my last episode as much as I enjoyed making it for you. Remember to visit professorslots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Let's start with the first segment of the show, Top 9 Slot Tips Review. A few weeks ago, a listener of my Professor Slots podcast asked for my opinion about a YouTube video she'd seen. I reviewed that video for her to come up with these top nine slot tips by Run Horse. Thanks for the suggestion, Leslie from Oregon. No spoilers, but one of the tips is a duplicate. Hence the name of this episode offering a review of this YouTube video. The actual name of this YouTube video from RunHorse.com is 10 Tips to Help You Win at Slot Machines. I've made an easy-to-remember link to this YouTube video. Just go to ProfessorSlots.com slash horse, and you'll end up at the video on YouTube. This episode has the following subsections. An introduction. 1. Playing someone else's losing slot machine. 2. Players' cards. 3. Machines sometimes hit in first few spins. 4. Minimum bets being more profitable. 5. Minor and major jackpots. 6. After machine maintenance, play. 7. Leave a machine if it's not paying. 8. Pay for the bonus, then cash out. 9. Increase bet size if you haven't won bonus. And a summary. 1. Playing someone else's losing slot machine. The video starts off with the narrator providing some introductory thoughts about increasing your chances to win, which he claims that casinos don't want you to know. He also advises slots players not to expect to win immediately. Further, that any slots player that gets upset playing a slot machine should just walk away. This tip is about playing a slot machine after someone has a lot of money on it. The idea promoted here is that the machine is somehow due for a win. No, sorry, but that's not how statistics work. It's like assuming a roulette wheel has had 15 prior landings on black, so it must land on red next time. Nope. It's a common misunderstanding with regards to statistics. But simply, past flips of a coin has no influence on future flips of a coin. As they say in statistics classes, past statistical behavior doesn't influence future results. The two are, well, independent. 2. Players' Cards The suggestion here is to get a player's card, multiple player's cards, or no card at all, if all else fails. The narrator states that most serious slots players believe players' cards affect the outcome of bets, despite casinos saying players' cards don't. This purported tip is a little tricky. More than a few casinos set up their machines to win within the first five pulls, then stop. It's not just new members to that casino's players club. In any case, how would a slot machine even know if you're a new player without changing the player's card? I suppose the machine being idle is the other way casinos can make a reasonable guess that any new player is not the old player. So I think this one is correct, but not for the reason the narrator gives. About three things are happening all together here. It's somewhat challenging to offer clarity, as it's a real mix-up of slot strategies. The further suggestion of switching cards is impressive. With two cards, you could try my five-pull approach twice for each slot machine. Again, that's interesting. But where do you get a second player's club card? Of course, each player gets only one account with a casino, so it must be someone else's card. The most likely person is a spouse, 
someone you share your finances with already. Slots players use other people's cards all the time, by the way. I don't think this is the same for poker, blackjack, or craps table games. There, the dealer takes your ID along with your card when you sit down to play, right? Bottom line, use a player's card. The other slot strategies suggested will be discussed by themselves in other tips this video will cover a little later. Later in this episode, I'll provide more commentary about what's really going on here. Be sure to check out Minnesota Slots 2018, where I point out a tribal state compact having an amendment which clearly states casinos cannot externally change the odds of winning on a specific slot machine during play. If you take your player's club card out of a machine, that's a signal to a modern casino's central computer system that it's legally okay to change the odds on that idle machine. So do take out the player's club card if you don't like your current odds of winning. But if you do like your odds of winning, then don't take your player's club card out of the machine. Otherwise, you risk losing those good odds. Sorry, that means no dinner for you or restroom breaks either if you're on a winning machine. 3. Machines sometimes hit in first few spins. Hey, he's explaining my five-pull approach. Yes, indeed, I like this one. Rather than do so again here, I've already explained this slot strategy fully in my podcast episode number 23, Winning Strategy 1, Main Slots 2018. The narrator doesn't seem to be aware it works better if the machine hasn't been played for a while. I figured this out when I took a winning strategy and put more time into it in my attempts to optimize it. Me again. I really do take any winning slot strategy and try to make it better. I've talked about making an annual profit playing slots equal to 30% of my annual pay for working my day job at, of being an aerospace engineer. But 30% really wasn't what could have been my profit. I spent all but 30% of my profit trying new strategies, only some of which were successful, and spent more on trying to figure out how to refine, perhaps even going so far as to optimize, those slot strategies that already were working somewhat. I did this for you, and well, to maybe pay off my student loans with this business, with a highly useful and helpful product, someday. Oh, I'm currently at 799 email subscribers, by the way. It's the end of March, and I've already gotten 103 new email subscribers this month. It's a record. Excel spreadsheet trend lines suggest I'll be at 2,000 email subscribers in mid-February 2020, about a year away. Keep those email subscriptions coming, and as always, get your free gift. 4. Minimum bets being more profitable. This is sort of true, but with a hidden danger. Some machines have a bonus round that won't activate unless you make maximum bets. So playing minimum bets on a slot machine with a bonus round means you're playing with lower odds. Playing minimum bets on machines without bonus rounds has the same odds as any number of credits bet. I like what he says about minimum bets on slot machines, which still have bonus rounds activated by minimum bets. I'll need to study that one further. The narrator also goes over the same tip at the end of their video, his tip number 10. I don't see how it is any different from this tip number 4. There, he just adds my suggestion about the hidden danger of any maximum bets activating bonus rounds. 5. Minor and Major Jackpots here, the narrator talks about looking for minor and major jackpots, which must pay out by a certain amount, and suggest playing them when they get close to those amounts. This is Peter Liston's basic progressive slot strategy, covered in my podcast episode number 46, Reviewing Slots King Peter Liston, plus Indiana and Iowa Slots 2018. Not that we know the full details of the Slots King's winning strategy for progressive slot machines. It's also my own Winning Strategy 2 Progressive Slot Machines, covered by my podcast episode 25, Winning Strategy 2, plus Massachusetts Slots 2018. So yes, this is the advantage play for progressive machines, which are what machines with minor and major jackpots are. Not everyone seems to realize this, so it looks like a new winning strategy rather than a well-known old one. Knowing the two jackpot limits can be tricky to figure out. As he says, a lot of people want to play them when they approach those limits. At the beginning of his tip number six, he even admits this is well known. Six, after machine maintenance, play. Here the narrator talks about how slot machines are more likely to pay out after a casino performs maintenance on the slot machine. 
This really goes back to his tip number three, which is missing my explanation about wanting the machine to be idle for a while first. This is simply just the five-pull approach I mentioned, where you play a machine that hasn't been played for a while. It doesn't matter why it wasn't played for a while, including because the casino has been working on it. He admits he doesn't know why. However, well, I do. I'm going to jump in here and say, correction, we do. 7. Leave a machine if it's not paying. Here, the narrator suggests you shouldn't get married to a machine. Bridal imagery aside, move along if you're not winning is near trivial advice. And yet, it's wisdom itself. I don't know if he realizes how profound this tip is. It's a good one, even if he doesn't seem to have any idea why. Too bad. You know to stop when you're losing, right? Put another way is the way gambling addiction counselors talk about it. You know to not chase your losses, right? Good. I'm glad. And so proud of you. 8. Play for the bonus, then cash out. The narrator talks about cashing out after you win, including if it's the bonus. Yes. Yes, indeed. Money management is a good thing. Walking away after every jackpot is the essence of the money management approach. I have yet to write a blog article on money management as a winning slot strategy. I did mention developing this skill in my book, Learning to Win, but haven't gone over it otherwise. Not really. I should. I will. Eventually. But this tip doesn't seem to take into consideration that you might be on a winning slot machine with excellent odds of winning. Yes, you can walk away after a big win, but should you? Sometimes. Sometimes not. It took me a long time to begin sensing the difference between being lucky, like being hit by a bolt of lightning, metaphorically speaking, versus the steady winning that can occur by playing a slot machine with excellent odds of winning. For the first circumstance, the bolt of lightning, leave the machine, walk away. That's the advice offered here. Under the second circumstance, where the only luck involved was in picking a winning machine, then stay. Stay, but don't take your player's club card out of the machine. Don't go for a walk. Don't get dinner. Don't use the restroom. Just stay. And keep playing your winning slot machine until you simply can't any longer. And even then, call your spouse or your friend to take over for you. Just if, when you do that, don't risk switching your player's club cards. And just in case, leave if you're not winning anymore. 9. Increase bet size if you haven't won bonus. The suggested tip here is to increase the bet size if you've been playing a long time and have yet to hit the bonus. This is a minor comment on another prior tip, tip number 5, about progressive slot machines. If this is a progressive slot machine he's referring to, which he's not clear about, then playing it a long time means it is possible that the specific amount where the major or minor jackpots must hit may be near. So he suggests increasing your bet size so that you're most likely to hit it before anyone else also playing those networked slot machines does. The bigger your bet, the faster the major and minor jackpot amounts climb, and the first one there wins. Otherwise, if it's not about winning on progressive slots, increasing bet size to get a bonus can be due to the bonus possibly activated by maximum bets only. And doesn't this contradict his number seven about leaving a machine if it's not paying? Maybe it is different. Maybe the machine is winning jackpots, just not any bonus rounds. That's the sort of details I wish this tip provided. Is it one winning strategy I know about and have told you about, or is it the other one? Details, details, details. In summary, Top 9 Slot Tips by Run Horse is a 13-minute YouTube video published in mid-November 2018. After four months, it's gotten almost 150,000 views. Here, I've given my thoughts on each purported slots tip. Again, a special thank you goes out to Leslie from Oregon for originally asking for my thoughts on this YouTube video. Thanks, Leslie. Remember to visit professorslots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Up next is the second segment of the show on slot machine casino gambling. Here, I provide a brief overview of the current state of gambling in two U.S. states, territories, or federal district, emphasizing, by far, anything of interest to slot machine casino gamblers. Up first is Michigan Slot Machine Casino Gambling 2018. Here goes. 
Michigan Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of three non-tribal commercial casinos in Detroit and 23 tribal casinos throughout the state. Caesars Windsor is just across the Canadian border from Detroit. A minimum payout return limit has been legally set for Michigan's non-tribal casinos. However, no actual payout return statistics are publicly available from either the non-tribal or tribal casinos. The minimum legal gambling age in Michigan depends upon the gambling activity. For land-based casinos, it's either 18 or 21. For poker rooms, bingo, the lottery, and parimutuel wagering, it's 18. At land-based casinos, the minimum legal age for gambling is 21 if alcohol is served. Otherwise, it is 18. Further, the minimum legal age for gambling at Canada's Caesars Windsor is 19 years old, where all winnings are paid in Canadian currency. According to Michigan's gaming regulations, all slot machines at the Detroit casinos are controlled by a central computer. It is illegal for a slot machine to have a hardware switch to change payout return settings. In 1996, Michigan voters approved three licensed casinos for Detroit via a bill eventually improved into the Michigan Gaming Control and Revenue Act. Howdy folks, I hope you are enjoying this presentation of Michigan Slots. I'm jumping in here because of my fondness and familiarity with Michigan. As I mentioned on a prior podcast episode when discussing tribal casinos, I was born and raised in Michigan. I was born in Flint, which you may have occasionally heard of in national news. I also lived in Flint as an adult for 12 years as I was figuring out how to go to college. My three associate's degrees are from Mott Community College. My two bachelor's degrees are from the small downtown Flint campus of the University of Michigan Flint. If you haven't been to Flint, then this probably doesn't mean a lot to you. But if you have, then it makes quite the impact. And there is a bit more. I worked my way through two-thirds of my undergraduate college experience downtown at the bank in Genesee Tower. Yes, for those of you keeping up with the math, I worked there for eight years. It was an evening job, so I could go to school during the day. Having that job probably saved my life. I'm not sure I've ever properly credited David Lossing for suggesting I apply for it. We were students together and then worked together at the bank for several years. He recently retired after being mayor of the city of Linden for decades. In any case, for me, that's Flint. But Ann Arbor has always been my favorite town. And Detroit is not as scary as everyone seems to think. When I introduce myself to my students on the first day of class, I tell them I'm from Flint. This was before the Flint water crisis was in national news. Anyway, I'd say I was from Flint. They'd look puzzled, like they didn't know where that was. So I'd say, it's like Detroit, only bad. These kinds of introductions can show students that their professor is a real person, that they're a human being, too. I moved to Ames, Iowa for graduate school at the tender age of 33. I lived in Michigan for those 33 years, living in Flint by myself starting when I was 20. I had no car, no phone, and sometimes no food or utilities. No worries, though, it all worked out in the end. You may remember something I mentioned in episode 45. Do you remember when I said I'm tenacious? That I'm determined? That I persevere? I really was serious about that. But moving on, I love Michigan. I think I've seen more of it since I left it, but that's only because for the most part I've had a car since then. Or I could rent one to come home to visit family. My family is currently mostly in the Saginaw area. If I was standing in front of you, I'd show you my palm and point to just below where my thumb and first finger come together. That's a Michigan thing, eh? It's like a map, see? Back to the show. Next up is a usually short statement about slot machine private ownership, which I have included in case you live in this U.S. state and are considering owning a slot machine. Here it is. In Michigan, it is legal to privately own a slot machine if it is 25 years old or older. The Michigan Gaming Control Board, MGCB, regulates the non-tribal commercial casinos in Detroit. They also provide compliance oversight authority for state tribal compacts with Michigan's federally recognized tribes. American Indian tribes in Michigan are sovereign nations. As such, the state of Michigan does not have general regulatory authority over Indian casinos, although the state has oversight authority of compliance with state tribal compact provisions. The National Indian Gaming Commission and the government of the appropriate tribal community regulate Michigan's tribal casinos. The negotiated tribal state compact for each tribe is found on the Indian Affairs website for Indian gaming compacts within the U.S. Department of Interior. Gaming regulations for Caesars Windsor in Canada are provided by the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario, a crown agency of Canada. 
However, the Ontario gaming jurisdiction is the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, OLG. In this section, I'll discuss Michigan gambling establishments. As usual, when there are too many casinos to mention here, a complete list along with links to the websites, assuming they've set one up, is available on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com slash mi. There are three non-tribal commercial casinos and 23 American Indian tribal casinos in Michigan. Also, across the Canadian border from Detroit, is Caesars Windsor Casino. The largest casino in Michigan is the MGM Grand Detroit Casino in Detroit, having 3,500 gaming machines and 143 table games. The second largest casino is Soaring Eagle Casino and Resort in Mount Pleasant, a favorite of my family, having 3,330 gaming machines and 60 table games. Detroit, Michigan's non-tribal commercial casinos, including the popular Windsor Caesar in Canada, are 1. Caesars Windsor across the Canadian border in Windsor, Ontario, 2. Greek Town Casino, 3. MGM Grand Detroit Casino, and 4. Motor City Casino and Hotel. Michigan has tribal state compacts with 12 American Indian tribes, which have produced 23 tribal casinos with Class Three Vegas-style games. At the end of 2017, these 23 tribal casinos had a total of 21,976 Class Three gaming machines. Tribal casinos in Michigan are a thriving business, and many major expansion projects are underway throughout the state. This is especially true for casinos in northern Michigan. A complete list of Michigan's 23 tribal casinos, including a link to the website and where they can be found within the state, is available on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com slash mi. Hi, me again. The first casino I ever visited was in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, at Kiwadin Casino. There's currently five Kiwadin Casinos, but the one I visited was in Manistique. This was back in 2003. I turned 40 that year. I've told this story elsewhere, so I won't repeat it here, but basically I was driving the long way home to Iowa by traveling up from Saginaw and over through Michigan's Upper Peninsula, then down through Wisconsin and Minnesota to Ames, Iowa, where I was in graduate school. But that's a long drive. So partway home, I spent the night just east of Manistique at a cheap hotel there on Route 2 along the top of Lake Michigan. When I checked in, they gave me free tokens for the casino just down the road. I was like, there's a casino? This was back when all slot machines used coins. Not that I knew that at the time. I certainly didn't know that they could also take tokens. As the slots expert I am today, I wonder how that worked. Sure, I can appreciate that even then a casino would want to give out free slots play. But before the networked players' club card interfaces we have today, free tokens must have been the method that made that work. What I now wonder about is how did the machine handle tokens, right? Back in the day, slot machines had several coin hoppers. But where did tokens go? If you won a jackpot, would you get a pile of coins with a few tokens thrown in? Or were tokens dropped into the non-jackpot coin hopper, also known as the overflow coin hopper? Yes, that sounds about right. Otherwise, the casino would have a mess on their hands trying to sort out who was trying to redeem tokens, which the casino gave out as free play. I understand that coins are basically gone unless you have an antique slot machine. But do you remember what casinos did back then? Specifically, did you ever find free tokens mixed in with the coins that came out of a slot machine as a jackpot? If so, let me know by leaving a voicemail at 702-90-SLOTS or by emailing me at john at professorslots.com where john is spelled J-O-N. As an alternative to enjoying Michigan slot machine casino gambling, consider exploring casino options in a nearby state. Michigan is bordered by, to the north and east, the Canadian province of Ontario, to the south, Indiana and Ohio, and to the west, Minnesota, and by ferry across Lake Michigan, Illinois. To visit any of my articles on these U.S. states, simply visit professorslots.com followed by its two-letter designation. For example, my Indiana Slots article is available at professorslots.com slash IN. According to the Michigan Gaming Control Board Administrative Rules, section 27A, on page 137, Each slot machine must not have a payout return less than 80%, but no more than 100%, unless otherwise approved by the Gaming Control Board. Further, payout return limits apply to playing skill-based electronic gaming machines perfectly without gameplay error. A rumored conversation with officials at the Michigan Gaming Control Board 
implied Michigan tribal casinos have a minimum payout return of 75%. However, I can find no evidence of such a legal requirement within any existing tribal state compact provision. Actual payout return statistics from three non-tribal commercial casinos in Detroit are not available to the public. Further, the tribes in Michigan don't release their actual payout return statistics to the public. The minimum payout return for Caesars Windsor and other casinos in the Canadian province of Ontario is 85%. For skill-based electronic gaming machines, such as video poker, it is 88%. These limits apply to each wager and play available on the game. Further, Canada's OLG offers a slots brochure stating Ontario casinos have a maximum payout return percentage of 99.1%. They also state Ontario has an average payout return of 91.8%. In summary, Michigan Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of three casinos in Detroit and 23 tribal casinos throughout the state. Caesars Windsor is a popular casino destination just across the Canadian border from Detroit. The payout return limits for Michigan's non-tribal casinos must be no less than 80% nor more than 100% for each electronic gaming machine. No payout return statistics are available from any of Michigan's casinos. In the last year, one additional tribal casino has opened, the Ottawa Casino Mackinac in Mackinac City. Further, the Luke View Desert Casino in Watersmeet was renamed Northern Waters Casino Resort. Remember to visit professorslots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Up next is a second state comprising this episode segment, Minnesota Slot Machine Casino Gambling 2018. Here goes. Minnesota Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of 19 tribal casinos with video slot machines and limited table games with cards. There are also two parimutuel wagering sites in the state, but no slot machines are at these racetrack facilities. Minimum and maximum payout return limits have been legally set within the tribal state compacts. However, actual payout return statistics are not publicly available. The minimum legal gambling age in Minnesota does not depend upon the gambling activity. For land-based casinos, poker rooms, bingo, the lottery, and paramutual wagering, it's 18. Minnesota had prohibited gambling prior to its statehood. In fact, the 1851 Territorial Legislature enacted strict prohibitions against all forms of gambling. This prohibition held for nearly a century and still influences legalized gambling in Minnesota. The convoluted history of legalized gambling in Minnesota from 1945 through 2005 is well documented via a 95-page report called Gambling in Minnesota, a Short History, available online from the Minnesota House Research Department. Minnesota's tribal casinos are located on their reservations. Establishment of tribal gaming regulations was through negotiated state tribal compacts, subsequently approved by the U.S. Department of Interior. Minnesota tribes were the first in the U.S. to negotiate and sign gaming compacts with a state government. Minnesota has 11 federally recognized American Indian tribes. Along with these tribes, Minnesota has negotiated 22 tribal state compacts to produce 19 tribal casinos in the state. Each tribe has two compacts one for video games of chance, and a second for limited table games with cards. Tribal casinos operate under a combination of state law, tribal ordinance, and tribal state compacts. Not regulated by the state are Class II competition-style games. These gaming compacts permit Class III Vegas-style games, but are explicitly restricted to blackjack and non-banked card games, such as poker, as well as video games of chance. These electronic video games include video poker, video kino, video slots, and others. The gaming compacts stipulate the Minnesota Department of Public Safety is responsible for the inspection and approval of these video gaming machines. Both parties agreed that the compacts should be effective to perpetuity, but renegotiations can occur if desired by both parties. The Minnesota state government makes all tribal state compacts publicly available at its Tribal State Gaming Compacts webpage, consisting of 100 downloadable PDF files. Minnesota was the first state where I discovered Tribal State Gaming Compacts were publicly available, even quite easily available online. This was back when I wrote my first Minnesota Slots article in my first series of state-by-state articles. For Minnesota, that was around Thanksgiving 2017. 
I was so excited to download all 100 PDF files. There are actually only 22 compacts, but each has several supporting documents as the compacts are updated. Yes, as I stated, the compacts are effective until perpetuity, and renegotiations occur only if desired by both parties. But apparently, both parties, that is to say the state of Minnesota and each of the 22 tribes, have agreed to renegotiate many times. Sometimes this is to include a blackjack amendment, or an amendment allowing video games of chance. So the tribe wants to renegotiate, to provide additional Class 3 games to their patrons, along with earning the resultant gaming revenue, while the state renegotiates to get income taxes from that resultant gaming revenue. It's a win-win situation. In fact, it's a win-win-win scenario because the patrons at those tribal casinos also get what they want, further games to play. Let's look at one such amendment. Here's one. It's called Amendment to Technical Standards in Tribal State Compact for Control of Class 3 Video Games of Chance at the Boise Forte Reservation in Minnesota. It's dated March 2, 2015, and signed by Mona Doman, Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and Kevin Lisi, Tribal Chair, Boise Forte Band of Chippewa. It starts off with some legalese, but then gets to the point that the amendment is, quote, for the express and limited purpose of adding a definition of logic control components to enable use of expanding modern technology, end quote. It goes on to say that logic control components, quote, means all types of program storage media used to maintain the executable program that causes the gaming device to operate, end quote. Sorry, I I was geeking out there for a minute. Love that wording. This is followed by five such storage media shall statements. As I look them over, I see that I have finally, finally found an example of the law that I've been looking for. I think you'll find this as significant as I do. Here it is. Quote, such storage media shall, one, be disabled from being written to when in the machine by a physical or hardware write to ensure that it's impossible to write any contents to the storage media during play, either from an internal or external source, end quote. The other four shalls have to do with security, safety, and standards. I suppose the first one, which I just read to you, does as well. But with regards to that number one, its consequences to at least one of the slot strategies I talk about is huge. I've talked about my winning strategy seven, win, walk away, return later. I covered this slot strategy in episode number 36, Return Afterward, Winning Strategy 7. As a quick reminder, modern casinos have automated the changing of the odds of winning on their slot machines. Basically, they've done this because of the increasingly huge crowds of people visiting casinos. This automation has provided two advantages for casino operators. It's let them reduce their personnel as well as hit daily financial performance metrics. Reducing their workforce of slot mechanics whose collective job it was to physically change the odds of winning after opening up and adjusting each slot machine, was a huge cost savings. But the other advantage was probably more important. An army of slot machine mechanics would take perhaps 7 to 10 days to get through a couple of thousand slot machines. That's a long time to go when trying to hit legal gaming requirements on payout returns. So they automated the changing of odds to do it electronically from a central computer server. Adjusting the odds of winning on all slot machines went from 7 to 10 days or more down to a few seconds, minutes, or hours. With this automation, casinos could hit their desired financial performance metrics daily or multiple times per day. In amongst all this is the slot's advantage play. At its simplest, it means a single slot machine once had the same odds of winning for a week or more. But now, thanks to this automation at modern casinos, the odds of winning could change over the course of a day. Do you see the advantage play here? Why don't you play your favorite slot machine at the time of day with the best odds of winning? All you need to do is figure out when that is, or more practically, recognize while you're playing it when you have great odds. The point of all this is the subtle requirement for optimizing this winning strategy. If you're smart enough or lucky enough to find a slot machine with great odds of winning, the best way to optimize your profit would be to continue to play that machine. The question I've always wanted to confirm was, can the casino change the odds of winning on a slot machine while a slots player is actively playing the machine? I'd heard a rumor that they could not do so, 
but have wanted legal confirmation. And I just found it. This statement, in an amendment to a tribal state compact, seems to be saying rather clearly that their tribal casino can't change the odds of winning on a slot machine using a computer central server, or otherwise, during play. Further, I believe during play means whenever a player's club card is in a slot machine. I am so thankful to have found this legal statement. As I've mentioned, I've been looking for an example of it to share. If I could find it somewhere, then I could start making assumptions of it being of general use within the gaming regulations in some or all other gaming jurisdictions. And now I know to look under anything related to storage media or external access to the slot machine. Excellent. I knew it must exist because I'd made so much gaming profit myself from playing slots from it when using my winning strategy number seven at a modern casino, the former Horseshoe Casino Cincinnati. Okay, that's enough of a rift. I'll get back to the show now. Regarding slot machine private ownership, in Minnesota, it is legal without restriction regarding the date of manufacture. Minnesota has six gaming control boards for various aspects of gambling oversight, including 1. The Department of Public Safety's Alcohol and Gaming Enforcement Division, AEGD. 2. Gambling Control Board. 3. Minnesota Racing Commission. 4. Canterbury Park Office. 5. Racing Aces Office. And 6. Minnesota State Lottery. The Tribal State Compacts provide for inspection and approval of video gaming machines by the AEGD, licensing of casino employees, machine payout percentages, and regulation of the play of blackjack. Specific overall responsibilities of the AEGD include licensing of manufacturers and distributors of gaming devices, gambling criminal enforcement and investigation, and assure compliance with state tribal compacts. There are currently 19 American Indian tribal casinos offering video slot machines in Minnesota. The largest casino in Minnesota is Mystic Lake Casino Hotel in Prior Lake, having over 3,500 gaming machines and nearly 100 table games. The second largest casino is Treasure Island Resort and Casino in Welch, having over 2,200 gaming machines and 50 table games. Minnesota's two paramutual facilities, Canterbury Park and Running Aces, offer blackjack and non-banked card games such as poker, but are legally prohibited from offering slot machines. A complete list of Minnesota's 19 tribal casinos, including a link to their website and where they can be found within the state, is available on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com mn. As an alternative to enjoying Minnesota slot machine casino gambling, consider exploring casino options in a nearby state. Minnesota is bordered by, to the north, the Canadian provinces of Manitoba and Ontario, to the east, Wisconsin, and across Lake Superior, Michigan, to the south, Iowa, and to the west, North Dakota and South Dakota. To visit any of my articles on these U.S. states, simply visit professorslots.com followed by its two-letter designation. For example, my Wisconsin Slots article is available at professorslots.com slash WI. Per tribal state gaming compacts, the minimum and maximum payout returns for slot machines are 80% and 95%, respectively, over the lifetime of the game. Further, Video Kino and similar games, specifically called out in these compacts, have a theoretical payout percentage requirement of no less than 75% applied to each number of spots marked per wager. Video games of chance affected by player skill, such as video poker and video blackjack, have a minimum and maximum payout return of 83% and 98%, respectively, again, over the lifetime of the game. These limits assume optimal play of these skill-based games. It's not required of Minnesota's American Indian tribal casinos to provide actual values for their payout percentages. However, Little Six Casino currently states on their website that they have the loosest slots in Minnesota, claiming to have a 95% payout return. In summary... Minnesota slot machine casino gambling consists of 19 tribal casinos with video machines including video slots. Otherwise, no slot machines are offered in Minnesota. Minimum and maximum payout return limits are 80% and 95% for video slot machines. Video Kino has a lower payout return limit of 75%. For skill-based games such as video poker and video blackjack, these limits are instead 83% and 98% but assume a perfect playing strategy for optimal play. Over the last year, an additional tribal casino has opened, the Shooting Star Casino Bagley near Chippewa National Forest in northern Minnesota. 
Remember to visit professorslots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Next up is a five-star review provided by Derek Everett from the U.S. version of iTunes on March 5th, 2019. Its title was Very Informative. The review was, quote, Professor Slots goes into all the details, sometimes maybe too deep, for the average casual slots player, but I find it to be a great resource for my playing. I have one homer using his information and strategy. Thanks, Professor. End quote. If you'd like to provide a rating and review for this podcast, which may well help other slots enthusiasts decide to take a listen to one or more of my episodes, simply visit professorslots.com slash Apple Podcasts to find my show on Apple to leave a review. Part one of the next episode of the Professor Slots podcast is not yet known. Both Scientific Games and IGT PLC have published their annual financial reports, so I owe you my analysis of those two big slot machine manufacturers. I'm not yet sure which I'll do first. On the other hand, I had a day job work trip to Pittsburgh a few weeks ago, so my casino trip report for Pittsburgh's Rivers Casino should probably come first. As I've mentioned, there's still a lot to write about. In fact, it feels like there's more every day. I may need to figure out how to type faster. And I just realized my next show will be episode number 50. That's quite the milestone. All the time and effort that it took to create those 50 episodes, all the learning that I went through, reminds me of my first year of physics graduate school. That first year was the hardest, most rewarding thing I'd ever done. And that held true right up to my second year of physics graduate school, which promptly replaced it as the hardest, most rewarding thing I'd ever done. Here's to another 50 episodes. May we all continue to learn and grow and get to know each other better. To make a suggestion or ask a question, which might end up as a blog article or on a podcast episode, email it to john at professorslots.com, where John is spelled J-O-N, or by calling 702-90-SLOTS to leave a three-minute or less voicemail. I'd appreciate your casino trip reports about playing slots if you'd care to offer that. By the way, that voicemail number is new. I'm quite proud of it, although getting it was mostly luck. I just wanted something that would be easier to remember. Even I couldn't seem to remember the old one, which is still active in case anybody calls it. I've tried to find a sequence of numbers which would spell out slots from those available from Google Voice, which means it would be a free service. And there I was, going through available combinations of slots, that's 75687, when I stumbled across 90 slots. It's from my elevator pitch for my business, that I won 90 slots jackpots in nine months and then a car. Plus, this is another lucky part. Do you know what city uses the 702 area code? Hey, that's a good answer. It's the city of Las Vegas. Part two of the next episode of the Professor Slots podcast are more brief overviews of the current state of gambling in two U.S. states, territories, or federal district. Next time, I'll be talking to you about the great U.S. states of Mississippi and Missouri. That's the end of another great episode of the Professor Slots podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Show notes for this episode are now available within most podcast apps, but are also available on my website at professorslots.com slash e49. I plan to have the next episode come out very soon for you. We'll have more amazing content for the show. Until the next episode, have fun, be safe, and make good choices. Bye.